always exciting when we get a chance to get a glimpse of what God is doing here on the mission field. And like we say as a church, we, you know, try as a small church to be a big part of what God is doing, you know, all over the world. And so whether it's there in Mexico or we've got ministries in Russia and Ukraine and Pakistan and India, uh, Africa, it is so exciting that we have these different connections, extensions of you guys. So, all right, let's get ready to get back into God's word together. We've got a message as we are continuing in this study last week. We left off kind of on this culminating message in Jacob wrestling with God. And we saw that whole process as God was breaking him in preparation for that blessing. And uh, as we're getting ready to, to, to get into God's word, I think we have some of our youth that are like, wait, do we stay? Do we go? So, hey, high school, if you guys are heading out with Pastor Daniel, junior high, you guys are headed out. You guys can start making your way now. This week, as we continue on, I'm going to start kind of a, uh, a series. We got to, like I said, next week we're going to do the baptism, but we're going to be looking at now what is those next steps? Because it's interesting as we begin to look at after this wrestling match, you know, Jacob is forever changed. New name, Israel. And he kind of walks with a limp, you know, you like blessed but limping. And I think this describes the Christian life for, for some of you guys. You're like, man, I've got this blessing, but I, I have this new realization of my total dependence on God. And I think as we navigate the Christian life and we look at some of these next couple of steps that happen directly following in these chapters, we see some of the hard things you know, that are a part of this blessed life. We're going to see today as we start with just, you know, kind of the time that we have left. We're going to look at Jacob and Esau in this ministry of reconciliation. We're going to look at this idea of making amends. Then we see in the, the, following, uh, the, the following chapter, we're going to watch as Jacob's family encounters a tragedy with his daughter Dinah. And, and they have to navigate this whole process. And then Jacob has to deal with the loss of his wife, Rachel. And ultimately, there's some betrayal as we get into the story of Joseph. And we see that the blessed life doesn't necessarily mean that no bad thing is ever going to happen. That is a lie from the enemy. So I think as we begin to look at some of these lessons you know, as we're navigating Joseph's, or excuse me, Jacob's story, it also equips us for the kind of things that we deal with here in our life as Christians, because that's where I left off last week. When we've had a real encounter with God, when we've experienced what it's like to, to wrestle with God and experience the blessing of God speaking truth and life over us, we can face anything, including some of the things that are on this list. All right, as we dive in, let's go ahead and stand up. I want to read a couple of verses to set the scene for today as we see this now culmination of Jacob and Esau. Let's begin here in Genesis chapter 33. I'll read the, the odd verses. We can read the even or the highlighted verses together. Let's start here in verse 1. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front. Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? He asked. Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, what's the meaning of all of these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me favorably, please accept the present that was brought to you. For God has been gracious to me and I have all that I need. And because Jacob insisted... Esau accepted him. All right, you guys can have a seat. 
You know, as we look at these two brothers, and like I said, this is kind of the culminating moment in the story. It's hard to capture the level of intensity, you know, that was preceding this story. I was trying to think of, like, what other, like, feuds can we think of that, like, instantly spark the, the intensity? And you guys might remember, like, the proverbial family, the Hatfields and the... McCoys and like instantly that triggers like this whole blood feud they did this they did that and that feud lasted nearly 20 years of bloodshed moved its way all the way up to a, a national scene the Supreme Court got involved I mean these two families it started with you know one family injuring another and then it's like well you got one of ours we're taking three of yours and then you know all of a sudden you have uh, two families at war for two decades and you think of the loss of life and how many people's lives were, were impacted because nobody had a way to end the feud. And as much as we kind of look at that and we chuckle and we just think, wow, you know, those people. But I would imagine for some, although maybe there's no bullets flying and blood feuds going, there are families strained, relationships strained to the point where maybe nobody, like I said, is firing bullets, but those emotional bullets, those things that get said, those doors that never reopen, the, the fact that it feels like, will we ever be able to bridge that gap? And for a lot of different reasons, I think families are, are dealing, you know, with some of these different issues Today, I read one quote that said, you know, people say, uh, uh, oh, hold on, I wrote it down because my, my brain is going to, because goodbye is easier to say than I'm sorry. How many divorces, how many families, how many prodigals where the journey starts that way because goodbye is easier to say than I'm sorry. You know, those two words are some of the hardest words to get out of our mouth. And yet at the same time, they can be one of the most powerful words to transform and change relationships and families. So today, we're going to focus on this idea of making amends. In a couple of weeks, we're going to get into the other side. The idea of like forgiveness and how do we forgive people when we've been wrong. But actually in our story today, the focus is on Joseph. As if Joseph is, so not Joseph, as if Jacob is actually taking the lead in here and making amends. And so I want to focus in on some of these principles and ideas of, of what it's like to actually pursue to seek out reconciliation. Now, what are some of those mindsets that make it hard today to deal with reconciliation? Like this is one that we hear a lot, right? Like, sorry, not sorry. Right? Like this is, this is kind of a, a, in, our, in our cultural lexicon. And, and what is that? It's this idea of like, man, I don't want to take responsibility. I'm sorry, not sorry. Like this idea that it's not really my fault. I didn't really do it. Like we have this aversion, this Teflon to be like, I don't, I don't want to actually acknowledge that I've done anything wrong. Like I'm sorry, not sorry. And then there's the other idea that kind of keep people away from this idea of pursuing reconciliation, right? Like it takes a big man to admit that they are wrong. And an even bigger man to beat that man up. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, that's the other person's fear, right? If I'm actually confronted with the idea of like acknowledging that I'm wrong, that like acknowledging I'm wrong is going is, is to have certain consequence. What if that person does this and that? And I'm going to get, there's all these other emotions and fear that can come with this idea of taking responsibility. As we get into our story, we recognize, like I said, that this rivalry runs deep. If you're familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau, we remember that even back in mom's womb, right? Like, like the, uh, she had gotten a message that these two nations were at war in her womb. Even in the womb, these babies are wrestling. And we watch as the story plays out because there was this unique prophecy as these twins would be born that the older, the one that was born first, would actually end up serving the younger, and as that prophecy played out, you know, there was this tension. Dad favored Esau, the older one, and mom favored the younger one. And we saw how that kind of favoritism already started problems within the family. But ultimately, if you remember the story, we saw how Jacob, you know, tricks Esau because Esau really didn't care about this whole birthright thing. He was hungry. He came in and he's like, I'm going to die. Give me some food. And Jacob's like, sure, sell me your birthright. 
You know, and that was kind of the beginning of this whole, like trying to take advantage of this situation. And then ultimately when dad thought he was going to die and pass the blessing, the inheritance down to the son, he was going to pass it to Esau. And mom hears that story. And is like, no, 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 no. I remember the prophecy. It's going to have to be Jacob. And so she has him dress up like Esau, literally puts on like goat skin and goes through this whole process of tricking dad. So that Isaac ends up blessing Jacob and ultimately Jacob steals the birthright blessing. And there in that moment, after Esau comes back, realizes what's happening, Esau's like vowing, I'm going to kill Jacob. And so Jacob goes on the run. And that's where we've been actually for the last couple of chapters is Jacob went up north with his mom's family. This whole story unfolds as he gets married and we have this whole crazy family, you know, kind of being born out of that whole chaos. And here we are today, 20 years later, 20 years after Esau had vowed to like kill Jacob and all these different things, these two brothers have kind of been locked in this battle. Like at some point, it's all going to come back together. And I don't know, maybe I'm describing some of your families. You know, maybe there are brotherly relationship. Maybe it's parent and child relationship. I don't know who that person is in your life, but maybe a decade goes by, two decades go by, and it's like not a word has been said. There's still that ember, that flame burning that makes you think, man, if we were to see each other, like, it's over. And that's where things were left. As we look at, again, some of these principles, again, I'm going to focus today because I think this is where the Bible, uh, it, it helps us zero in on maybe one facet. So we're going to zero in on this part of the story and this idea of making amends. When we get a couple weeks into the story and we look at Joseph, we're going to see what happens when we are wronged and the difficulty of like extending forgiveness because that story in Joseph's life does, gives us a great insight into this idea of how do we actually give forgiveness when we've been wronged. But I think what we see in this story, we can focus in on this first half. We don't get to talk about this half a lot, but I want to talk about this idea of making amends, pursuing reconciliation. We're going to look at some of these different principles here. So let's go back here in our, in our Bibles and let's look at the, the beginning of this different idea. In Genesis chapter 33, verse 3, and, and, and here's what I want to talk about today. If God's tugging you on the heart and he's reminding you of maybe a relationship, a person, a situation where God might be calling you to take step one in making amends. It says, then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. First thing I want to talk about in this idea of making amends and seeking reconciliation is when we look at Jacob's life, it's God initiated. Okay. Like when we begin to ask ourselves, because again, some of you guys are going to be thinking today, maybe God's poking at your heart. Maybe God's speaking something to you and you're like, how do I know it's the right time? How do I know that I need to be pursuing this? How do I know that this door is open? Well, first, we need to kind of start with this idea that reconciliation, the idea that Jacob is going back home, that he's going to actually have to confront his brother and deal with some of these things, it's starting with God. That when I begin this process, this journey of like, okay, Lord, where are these areas that you're wanting me to go and grow in? It's God who has to kind of start that process. And I'll get into why that is in just a little bit. But we have to understand that reconciliation begins and ends with God. That's got to be at the, the catalyst, the heart of why, what, and even how we're pursuing this idea of reconciliation. Notice that Jacob has a promise because again, this is a hard question. You want me to go back to that place where my brother said he was going to kill me. And notice as he's beginning this process that God says, look, I am telling you it's time to go back. But number two, I'm also telling you that you are not what? You are not alone. I am going with you. I will be with you. As you're beginning to navigate the process of some of the things that have happened and have gone in on your life and you're already, your heart's beating a little bit and you're thinking, Lord, I couldn't go back and talk to this person or that person or this certain situation. You need to understand that God's not asking. He's not sending you on a mission alone. If God is directing you and leading you back into a situation where he's calling you to this aspect, this ministry of reconciliation, number one, if God is calling you, he is going with you. And if he is going with you, that means not only is he preparing you, but he's preparing what? He's preparing them. Now, as we navigate this story, 
just a little bit, a couple of things that I want to I wanna make an observation about. Sin doesn't have an expiration date. What do I mean by that? How long has it been since Jacob went through this whole process of stealing Esau's birthright? We had it earlier in the slides. 20 years. 20 years has gone by since this whole story has unfolded. Families have been born. Marriages have been born. Whole, whole, whole chapters in life have been written. Yet there's still something that God is wanting to do in Jacob's life. There's still something that God is wanting to do in Esau's life. There's still something God wanted to do in the family. And I need to just say this because sometimes, yeah, uh, history and, and life goes on. But the reality is for some of us, we realize that your past can start to get in the way of your present and even get in the way of your what? Your future. And there will be times in your life where God is going to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, sin doesn't have an expiration date. Just because a long time has gone by and God's done these blessings and these other things in your life doesn't mean that he doesn't still maybe want to work in this area. Because sometimes you just think, it's been a long time. Can't we just move forward? I hear you. And there will be, as we talk about, sometimes the right way, the right time, the right place. There are answers to that question. It's not always possible to pursue face-to-face -face reconciliation. It's not always healthy to pursue face-to-face -face reconciliation. But when God taps you on the shoulder and says, I want to deal with this, it's because I can't just say, well, sin has an expiration date. One of these books that highlight that principle, you know, if, um, if you're flipping through the pages of the New Testament and like Hebrews is stuck together, like you can miss the whole book of Philemon. This is one book. Love this book. Favorite, like little short book. When I um, would go into like the maximum security prisons in Hungary, we would get a chance to go share like, this is one where I would like to, to sometimes speak from because here Paul is, ends up in prison. And as he's there in prison, the guy that he's chained to, and this was kind of like Paul's ministry. If I'm stuck in prison and I'm chained to somebody, guess what? Y'all going to hear the gospel. Like he's like, you can't go anywhere. And so as Paul was connected to this guy Onesimus and he was beginning to share the gospel and pour into his life, God began to do a work in Onesimus. And as the story continued to, to develop, he would understand a little bit about Onesimus' story and how he had run away. And maybe we don't know exactly what happened. Maybe Onesimus had stole something. But as God would have it, Paul knew the person who Onesimus had wronged. Right? Like imagine you end up going to jail and the guy that you're connected with knows the person. Like, like, like you got in trouble you know, in terms of that whole story. And so as God begins ministering and, and preparing for Onesimus to go, Paul says, hey, Philemon, here, Onesimus is what I want you to do. I'm going to write a letter to Philemon, my friend, the person that you wronged, and you're going to take it to him. Now as you're thinking about that, it's like, okay, cool, I'm going to take him a letter. But now as you're starting to think about it, that means... God is sending uh, Onesimus back to Philemon, the person that he wronged. And there are times where that's exactly what happens in our life. God does a work. He does this work of discipleship and building up, encouraging. But sometimes he says, I want you to what? I want you to go back. And I want you to make this right. Why? Because you're different. And this is going to give an opportunity for the work of the gospel to go on. And I can just imagine, like, oh, you want me to do What? But it's, a, it's an amazing book about reconciliation and how God is working through Paul and Onesimus and Philemon. And we can get into that book, another story. But that's a great example biblically of where God says, hey, sin doesn't have an expiration date. I've done this work in you. You're a new person. Paul even says it. But he's like, hey, I'm sending you back because I want to deal with this. Now, one of the things that I know is stirring up in your guys' heart, because we're looking at this story and we see that here as God is calling Jacob back into this place to go back into his family. And we see here on this first part of the verse that Esau, we don't know how he's going to respond. This is Jacob's fear, right? Esau is coming with 400 men. It looks like Esau didn't get the memo, you know, that, that Jacob is coming seeking reconciliation. Esau, it looks like is coming ready for war. 400 men. And this is where I want to stop and talk for just a moment because some of you guys are asking, is it always a good idea to go seeking to like make things right, to go have that face-to-face, person-to-person, like, all right, I need to go back and follow up with this person in this particular situation. 
Some of you guys know um, we as a church have a 12-step ministry. We had a group that meets on Sunday nights, and we have a number of people in our church who have been blessed by 12-step programs. I know myself, when God was beginning to do this work of restoration and, and, and building, um, building up these, these, these radical changes in my life, he used a 12-step program to help with that process of like taking baby steps, you know, to begin to understand like, okay, hold, what is God doing to, to bring us to that place of rescue and recovery? One step that you'll often hear people refer to as we talk about this idea of step nine, making amends. And this is where I want to give you a little resource because I think, man, a whole lot of people, their lives would be radically impacted in their Christian life by encountering, walking through some of these different programs. But let me give you a little insight into step nine. Step nine says, we may direct amends to such people wherever possible. Notice the part that's highlighted. Except when to do so would injure them or others. You know, in step eight, it, it, it challenges you to make a list of those people you've wronged and those things. It's about taking accountability, you're taking this inventory. But then when you're encouraged in step nine to like actually do something about it, there's this little qualifier that reminds us that it's not always the healthiest, right? To just jump back into somebody's life five years, 10 years, 15 years later. Like sometimes we can interject ourselves into a situation and cause more harm than good. And so there's this little reminder, there's this little counsel, there's this little caveat, you know, that we, ha uh, that we say that says, look, except when to do so would it injure them or others. Let me talk a little bit about what I mean by that. As I was looking at one of these other resources, it said the purpose of making amends isn't just to soothe our guilty conscience and to move on from past mistakes. It's also to express our regret and remorse in a way that shows the other person how much we care. We want to communicate to them how sorry we are for the things that we've done, that we care about them and their feelings so much that we want them to know how sorry we are. When we're making amends, the other person's feelings are just as important as what? Our own. And what that's reminding us about is as God begins to touch your heart and say, hey, there's some areas you need to go make right. And then you have this feeling of like, okay, I need to go do this. The challenge is we have to make sure that as I'm thinking and praying about how to do that, I'm not just thinking about who? Me. I'm thinking about that other person and their life and what's going on in their life. And I'm asking God to prepare me and prepare them so that when that is done, who gets the glory? God. Like that's the idea in this ministry of reconciliation. As we begin to look at Jacob, we recognize that obviously this idea of reconciliation can stir up a lot of emotion. For Jacob, he was totally afraid, right? He's thinking he's coming with an army. I don't know, it's all gonna go down. I'm gonna lose my family. And he starts getting everything set up. He's like, okay, man, we're just gonna have to go through this. But remember, he had just had an encounter with God. He had just experienced this whole wrestling and revelation and realizing that the God of the universe is intimately involved in his life. And the God of the universe is the one that had called him and directed him and promised to be with him. And so as he's standing there preparing for however this thing is about to ensue, there's this confidence. If God has called me into this ministry of reconciliation, then I'm going to have to trust all of the process, all of the results up to him. Now, as we observe what happens next, I think there are four principles Four things as we kind of observe that, hey, there's some, there's some important things as I'm considering and praying about reconciliation, praying about the other person, praying about the timing and the process. But when we actually come to that moment of saying, how do I say I'm sorry? How do I make amends? How do I do that the right way? Let me just highlight four healthy observations that I think we see from Jacob as he's about to encounter Esau. Four things, if you're following along with me on the app, you can fill them in. Number one, we see humility. Number two, we see vulnerability. We see sincerity. And we see generosity. These are four things that we can see manifested in Jacob as he's about to have this encounter with Esau. All right, let's look here where I'm getting these ideas from. So notice, again, here as we get back into our story and we look at verse two and Jacob sets all these people in a row and he's got them all lined up and now he's ready to face Esau. And it says, Jacob himself, what? He leads the way. He goes on ahead 
And then he bows down to the ground seven times as he approaches his brother. Now, I think as we see this first observation, we can start to see this posture, this attitude of humility. I like this quote. Humility leads to strength and not to weakness. Is the highest form of self-respect to admit mistakes and to make amends for them. As we mentioned earlier, sometimes we have a real aversion to this idea of saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I think there's a whole generation that just is allergic to those words, right? Like it is, it is, it is really hard to see people take responsibility. Just any, any of us that have ever been in that position know how hard that is to get those words out. As we're thinking about here in just another uh, two weeks, we're going to be celebrating Father's Day. And for those of us who are our parents, man, I think about like the joy of being with my, my kids. And as you're thinking about this story and we're thinking about, you know, Jacob and he's got like 11 kids now and all these different people. But I want you to, I want you to notice as you're setting the scene in your mind is he's got them all lined up. He's got the servants and their kids and he's got Rachel and his kids and, and, and he's got Leah. All the kids are there. And then Jacob goes out to the very front and he humbles himself in front of Esau. I want to say this, and this applies to each parent that's out there, but this idea of walking in vulnerability and in humility, you know, I know for myself as a dad, I've had to process this in my own life, but if our kids see our mistakes, they should also what? See our amends. You know how many times I've had to like, you know, when you lose your, your temper or you, you know, you didn't do things the right way that you wanted to do. And, you know, your kids can all be a part of that chaos. And then, and then you just want to move on. You just want to kind of go on like, all right, we're, let's just keep going on with the day. But our kids don't forget those things, do they? And imagine how powerful, how significant. And, and there are moments that I've had to stop and what? Humble myself in front of my kids and say, that's not right. Dad shouldn't talk to you that way. Dad shouldn't talk to mom that way, right? They hear these things, but this idea of like making amends, humbling myself, putting this posture of vulnerability, thinking that, man, my kids are going to see me be weak, be vulnerable. But hold on. That willingness for Jacob to lead in front of his family, we're going to notice a little bit later, we see his family kind of responding with Esau. Now, it's interesting to see how Esau is going to receive all of them, but I think this posture of humility and vulnerability goes a long way, as the Bible says, a gentle answer, what? Turns away wrath. And I think as parents, I mean, we're so aware of our own mistakes, and we're aware of those different things, but how much am I aware that God may be saying, hey, this is now an opportunity to lead and showing my kids, what is it like to humble yourself and to actually make amends, take responsibility, say, hey, this wasn't right. I want to do better next time. Would you forgive me? Shouldn't have that kind of attitude. If you're wondering why your kids are struggling with taking responsibility, don't just blame the culture. We need to look in the what? We need to look in the mirror. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility, Rick Warren says, is thinking more of others. You know, one of the things that can really mess up an apology is making it about who? <laughs> making it about you, right? It's like we can, we can make an apology, I'm so sorry, and then I can explain all the different problems that are going on in my life and all the reasons why I did what I did, right? It's the proverbial, I'm sorry, but... And I want you to notice as Jacob is taking this posture of humility and vulnerability, he comes in and he bows down seven times before Esau. Now remember, Jacob has the blessing. The blessing has been confirmed by God. And I think when we've had that sense of security and identity right with God, being made right with others gets a whole lot easier. I think that's why he's able to have this posture of humility and vulnerability with his brother. But notice as he comes and he, as he bows down to him, he's coming and he's saying, I'm not a threat, right? But more than just saying, I'm not a threat, he's acknowledging when you look at the extravagance of the gift, 
When you look at the fact that it says he bowed down seven times, because when we get into one of these other chapters and we understand the way the story plays out biblically, Esau really becomes kind of the king of that whole area of Edom, etc. And Jacob is treating him like a what? A king. Remember, having stole his birthright, having stole his blessing, it's like there was a dishonoring of Esau and that whole relationship, but I'm sure he justified it and had all these different reasons and et cetera. But now as he's coming back and he's bowing in a posture of vulnerability, et cetera, he's acknowledging, right? Like the place, the person, he's honoring Esau in that moment. And I think that really is an important part. When we go to make amends with somebody, there is that part of acknowledging their own humanity, their pain, their feelings. Because a lot of times we want to make an apology all about who? Make it about ourselves. Because that's just the way that we're wired. And we notice as Jacob comes and he bows down, he's vulnerable in front of his family. He's humble in front of his family. He's humble in front of Esau. Why do I say this? Because you can make an unhealthy amends, as we were highlighting a few minutes ago. One of the different um, resources that I was looking up says it this way. We'll be making amends to feel better about ourselves rather than to repair the damage we've caused. We would be apologizing just so that we no longer feel guilty rather than because we want to heal the wounds we've created. Have you ever had that kind of apology <laughs> where somebody's just saying, I'm sorry, right? Like, in other words, I'm just, it's like they're a hostage situation or something, right? Like, okay, I have to say this, you know, because now I'm just trying to like get this argument over. Or there's the other one, right? There's this idea of I'm asking for forgiveness and I'm using it as a pretext for seeking sympathy or fishing for an apology. But in reality, it's about taking responsibility for my actions, not theirs. And you've had that happen to you, right? Someone says, I'm sorry, and then they're waiting for you to what? Like, okay, now it's your turn. And then when you don't reciprocate with the apology, of like, I take it all back. As if really the apology was just a pretext to get you to say what they really wanted to hear. You know, or, or, or the opposite, right? Like, I'm going to say I'm sorry, and I'm going to pour out all this other stuff about woe is me and why I did it, etc. And we realize, man, that's, that's not reconciliation, that's not me honoring this person. That's not me taking responsibility for the things that I've done that hurt or dishonored. And so when we look at this idea of like, okay, what is Jacob doing as he's coming in and he's bowing before and he's presenting these gifts and he's doing it in front of his family. And as we're thinking about this idea that, yeah, there are relationships that God's calling me to make an amends, but am I really making amends the right way? Or am I just checking a box because, well, I needed to say I'm sorry. And then we just go on. Verse four, Esau ran to meet Jacob. He embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and they wept. And it says, and then all the female servants and their children approached and they also bowed down. What an amazing response, unexpected. That was not what, what Jacob, I think, initially thought was gonna happen when he heard he was coming out with 400 men. And we see as Esau is going to ask, as Jacob is giving all of these different gifts, this extravagance, and he says, hey man, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds and stuff like that? And Jacob says, look, it is, it is so that I can find favor in your eyes. It's Jacob's way of saying, I'm trying to make this right. In a sense, he's like, I stole all this from you. This is me making this right. Now, there's a whole bunch of cultural things I don't have time to get into in terms of this negotiating and bargaining. No, I don't want it. Yes, you need to take it. And ultimately, him honoring him by receiving that gift. But as we get into our, our last section here, and we're looking at these last aspects about how do we make amends the right way? Number uh, Verse four, we see the response, right? Like an unexpected response. It doesn't always go this way, but we see Esau moved with this emotion and compassion. It says, and they wept. And I think this is a great picture of sincerity. Like meaning Jacob went into it full well, hoping, wanting for the reconciliation to happen. And as God begins to break down the walls and hearts begin to get open and Esau's like responding there emotionally, Jacob responds, there's this sincerity. We see this emotion that's ready to respond right there where the other person is at. It doesn't always mean that the other person's gonna react this way. Well, Caleb said, if I respond with humility and sincerity, you know, it doesn't always mean that you're going to get this person weeping and hugging you. But here we see that when it comes to this idea of sincerity, a sincere apology makes no presumptions on the response of the wounded party. 
Remember, why did Jacob head back this way? Because God told him to. The idea wasn't, I'm going this way so that I can get this from Esau. The idea is, I'm going this way because God told me to go this way. And as God is sending me back this way, I've got to make these things right because I've got to be obedient to who? To God. So when I go and make an apology, I'm not making it based on the other person's response. My job is to make things right regardless of the other person's response. The sincerity is I'm doing this because I actually believe that I have something to be accountable for, that I need to take responsibility for. That's why I'm doing it. Does that make sense? And in the event that the doors open up and the walls come down, there's that willingness to be ready to reciprocate and release the offended party from owing you anything. Right? Like, man, if the walls come down and that person's ready to like, huh, then it's like, hey, we're ready to move forward. And if that person's not ready then yet at that moment, hey, I'm releasing you from any, you don't owe me anything. You don't have to follow up with your apology and these different things. I came to do what God called me to do. And I got to walk in obedience and sincerity with that. True reconciliation does not consist in merely forgetting the past. You know, it's not just about saying, hey, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Those are important words. But sometimes, like we see in the book of Philemon, God's calling us to do more than just say with our words, I'm sorry. Sometimes there's actually a, a, an idea of restitution where we need to take responsibility. There may be financial things that I need to make right. There may be actual things that I need to follow through. It doesn't mean I can do it all right now. But it means that I need to take responsibility and say, hey, how do I make this right. Philemon chapter 1 verses 12 through 14. This is what we were talking about. Paul is sending him back and he says, look, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him here with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would seem voluntary. And so we can see with Paul, when it comes to this idea of reconciliation, he's like, I am sending this back, this guy back, because he needs to make things right. I'm not just going to assume that you're going to forgive him, that you're going to let go of the debt. That you're gonna, like, I, that's, that's not fair to do when dealing with this ministry of reconciliation. I have to give you an opportunity to deal with this person face to face and begin to release or deal with it however God leads. I don't want to assume. I don't want to take this opportunity away from you. And you give God room to work in that moment. In Luke chapter 19, this is how God stirred up Zacchaeus' heart. You guys remember that? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. The wee little man was he climbed up in the sycamore tree, right? He was that, he was that main tax collector in the city, has an encounter with Jesus. And there, as Jesus begins to do a work in his heart, he has this, 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 this desire inside of him to say, I now need to make these things right, and it says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here I am. I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, what? I will pay back four times the amount. So yeah, generosity was great. But this idea of like the people that I've wronged, this is the way that I want to make it right. And he had this response. It wasn't even Jesus said, Zacchaeus, you need to do this before you get saved. Nope, Jesus looked at him. Jesus loved him. Jesus said, I want to go to your house. And in that moment, as he began to experience this conviction, this revelation, this was his response. It was a work of God's spirit. And I guess that's another question as we're processing this story in our own life. Am I willing to make it right? Reconciliation might hurt, but it's not as painful as dying in unforgiveness. Some of you guys still carry around that weight, some of those wounds of people that you say, I wish I could have had that conversation on both sides. Some of you are like, man, I wish I would have been able to say, I'm sorry. I wish the last thing we said to each other wasn't that argument. For some of you guys, you know, you're on the, the other side of it. Like, man, I wish, you know, I, I would have been able to say, I forgive you to that person. But here's the thing. If you're processing that today and some of those people are still alive, you don't have to wait 
in terms of like, well, chapter's done, book is closed. Like if God is calling, if he's tapping you on the heart, imagine if there's been a transformation, if there's been a change, if God has done a radical work in your life, no greater opportunity to share the gospel story of the grace of God than for me to take some of those steps where I've been wrong and seek to make those things what? Right. Because of who God is and what God has done. But when I do it, I need to do it in a way that honors who? God, it's not just about me feeling better. It's about me honoring Christ. Now, some of you guys, as you're looking at this, like, man, there's financial implications. It's hard. What if they yell at me? What if this all goes bad? Like, why is this so hard? Let me just close with this. Because I know this is hard. I've had to navigate it in my own life. I had all kinds of messy stuff that God had had to bring me out of and then begin to work through. And I think as we understand why it feels so hard, there's a lot of fear and taking responsibility of being accountable because of rejection, you know, because of this idea of our facing our own imperfections and this idea of just shame, this, this, this stuff that the enemy loves to poke and say, look how terrible you are. Look what you've done. We all have those insecurities. And the enemy plays on them every time that we feel like we're taking that first step in that direction. And so what do we do about it? Well, one of the most powerful parts of the gospel is the fact when we think about why is it so hard to come up to somebody and say, I'm sorry? It's because we really don't know how they're going to react. We don't know if they're going to say, I forgive you or I hate you. We don't know if they're going to say, hey, let's make this right or I don't ever want to see you again. That fear of rejection and loss, it just, it's, it's like I said, it's easier to say goodbye than I'm sorry. But here's the thing that you need to know about the gospel. This is part of my job as a pastor, probably my favorite part of the job. The Bible talks about in 1 John 1, 9, if we what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's already told you what he's going to say before you say it. The word confession is a Greek word, homologeo. It means to say the same thing as, I'm just agreeing with God about what he already knows. I'm saying, Lord, you know this and I was wrong. I rejected you. I did this. I'm agreeing with God with what he already knows. How many guys know what a parking ticket is? You go into the garage, right? Go up there and you're like, oh, I got to go like visit this person or I go to work, et cetera. And then, and then they give you a little ticket. And then one of the things that you know, if like I go to a certain business, et cetera, and they say they have validation, you're like, yes, right? You got to remember to get it validated. And then you go in and you get it validated. They give you the little stamp in the parking lot, right? Now, when you get it validated, you're not quite done yet, Right? You still got to go to the toll booth. And this is the beauty of the gospel. I'm telling you today, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. I'm not forgiving your sins. I'm telling you, I am validating that stamp of guilt and fear and shame. And I am telling you by the power of God's word, if you will confess it, if you will deal with it, now you still have to go to the what? The toll booth. You got to come to the Lord in prayer and show him that ticket and say, Jesus, I was wrong. and I know I shouldn't have done that. But your word says, pastor said, your word says, if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive them. You know what's going to happen? Boop. Because it was validated in truth. This is God's word to you and I today. That's what we get to do as Christians. It's not our job to forgive them. But we get to put that validation stamp and say, this is what the word of God says. Now go talk to God about it. And let God begin to lift that burden. Let God express to you that forgiveness. That's what we need to know today. When you face that, when you've been made right with God, when you've dealt with the first sin first, because that's the crazy thing about Psalm 51 and David explaining all of his sin is, and to you alone have I what? Sin, and you're like, it didn't seem that way with Bathsheba and Uriah. But David knew that sin first and foremost is against who? God. And when we deal with that first, and we can be made right with God, well, being made right with people is a whole lot easier because all those fears, right, of who I am, my shame, my guilt, I can say I'm loved, I'm forgiven, I'm a new creation, and I now have the spirit of God living in me. Now I can go face my Esau. Now I can go stand in whatever that situation is because I've already experienced that with God. Now, whoever I have to stand in front of, 
Whether I'm writing a letter or an email or a text or a phone call or I get the opportunity to do it in person, I can do it because I've first been made right with God. It becomes a whole lot easier to be made right with people. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we look at this Jacob and Esau story, we're grateful that these two brothers that were locked in this whole irreconcilable story, that Lord, that's just a little snapshot. As we think of the brokenness of marriages, the brokenness of prodigal sons, the brokenness of Lord, the the hurt that's happened in our lives. And Lord, today we're standing here remembering that sometimes Lord, it's us who were on the causing end of these things, our choices, our actions. And so, Lord, today we would ask first and foremost, as we confess our sins, God, that you would forgive us for the hardness of our heart, for our selfishness, for our choices that put our needs, our wants, our desires over the lives, over the hearts of those people that we've hurt. Lord, we confess that we, uh, Lord, we do the things that we don't want to do and we hurt the people that we don't want to hurt. And Lord, we don't want to keep doing that. And so we would ask, Lord, like Jacob, Lord, that as we encounter the gospel, the truth of the gospel, and Lord, as we come to that place of absolute surrender, that Lord, we too would be changed, that we would be that new creation. Lord, that person that can look at that other person and say, I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm not that person anymore. I take responsibility. I was wrong because we've experienced your love, your grace, your spirit in us. Lord, there are great things that you want to do in and through our church, and those great things start right here in our hearts. We pray that the revival, the tearing down, and the building up, Lord, that you're wanting to do in our lives would begin right here today. Begin it in us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand. Let me just remind you today as we're closing out, you don't have to do this alone. We touched briefly on a subject that can be kind of a lightning rod for a lot of questions and emotions. I want to encourage you, you still got another week or so of your small groups. Take advantage of the wisdom and the grace of the people that God has surrounded you with. If you've got questions, there's particular situations, some of you guys are dealing with this with family and relationships, I'd love to come alongside you or the men's ministry or women's ministry. Reach out to us this week. This isn't something that we just snap a finger and it all goes away. As well as we have some people in the back who would love to pray with you and pray for you. But let me close with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you guys this week. Let's go out and be reconcilers. Spirit break out Break our walls down